Welcome to Outlaw Bookseller, and today we're going to play a game of clones. Clones are a familiar trope in SF, but still not that commonly used compared to a lot of other popular symbols of future tech that has potentially society changing implications. So as I've just reread one of the most famous cloning books, I thought we'd talk about two of my favorites today. And a while ago, I read John Varley's A Fierky Hotline. I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced. I can never get it right. And he doesn't really use them very convincingly because as a characterizer and pro stylist, he's no great shakes. So his utilization of them doesn't really hit home very well on the humanist front and make us think of the human implications. It's all very well and good in a scientific sense, an adventure sense, but it's not really a great example of you know what you can say about humanity and society using the idea of cloning. Now, I'm sure many of you have encountered other examples of the use of clones in SF, and there's examples like Pamela Sargent's Cloned Lives, but you know, there aren't that many clone books out there. <laughs> You'll probably prove me wrong when I come up with loads. So that'd be quite interesting. I first read about clones in a fake documentary book that came out in the late 70s, and I think it was remaindered. And I think it's by somebody called David Rovick. I'll try and flash an image up on the screen. And it was called In His Image. And it purported to be the description of the first ever real case of human cloning. And of course, you know, it's almost certainly not real because the tech wasn't there yet. And, you know, it's a difficult task. It's not an easy bit of, you know, tech to sort of master. And then, you know, along came Dolly the sheep a good bit later, the first real higher mammal clone. Um, and before that, in rock and roll, we had songs about clones. There was the wonderful Spirit of the Age by Hawkwind, written by... Robert Calvert, their then singer and lyricist, and Calvert had previously written SF poetry for New Worlds magazine. You know, he was he knew Moorcock, you know, they were friends, so it was one of those things. Also, you had Alice Cooper did a great song on one of his solo albums in about 1979 called We're All Clones. That's a great song, and that's well worth hearing, and it's a great example of his work from that period because he wasn't exactly firing all cylinders then. But today in this game of Clones, I'm going to look, as I say, at my two preferred identical humans novels. Now, I will say I'm always suspicious of mainstream literary writers of huge commercial and critical stature who suddenly produce an SF novel. And the thought of Ian McEwan's Machines Like Me, which is about AI, for example, really gives me the fear. That's a classic example of it. But there is, of course, a, you know, for every sort of thing for everything like for every fear of that kind there's an exception that proves the rule and i think this book never let me go by kazuo shiguru this is a first edition copy is the one which really sort of proves the case really and this book uses the c word twice in its entire length and it was something that when it came out i greeted trepidatiously the thing is mainstream writers often haven't read the genre classics. They seem to think they can do better. They seem to think they're being original. And all too often, their reviewers in the mainstream press, who are similarly ill-read and biased against genre fiction, will overpraise these efforts on the grounds of what is, quite frankly, ignorance and disrespect for the pioneers. They always come up with the argument that better prose makes for a better novel. But that isn't always the case when the handling of the science and the conceptual side um, is ham-fisted compared to that in the earlier works of genre SF that cover the same subjects. And, you know, there is a lot to be said for good prose. And there are an awful lot of writers writing mainstream novels, mimetic realism of character and sort of social mores, who are better writers technically than SF writers. You know, that's the thing. But they are the mainstream, remember. They're not a specialised cadre. They are the river rather than the brook. 
So that's an important distinction to make. Never Let Me Go, the first time I read it was when it was first published. And I have to say, I'd read Remains of the Day, his book of prize winning um, historical and mainstream novel, which is really, really good and a fantastic piece of work. And when Ish did this, I kind of had my knives out because I thought there's no way he's going to be able to manage this and I wanted to cut it to pieces with my rapier. I wanted to slice it with my razor and really sort of deconstruct it and show why it wouldn't be a good SF novel. But it took hold of me by the neck, drew me in, gave me a kiss and I absolutely loved it. And I remember, I have said this before recently on the channel, but it's worth repeating if you haven't seen that video. I was traveling to Swindon and this would have been 2006, 2007, to give a lecture at a college there about SF. And it was part of my promoting my book, 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels. I was doing a lot of those sort of things at that time. And I didn't want to go. I'd been paid. I'd written the lecture. It was in my head. And there was an audience and who had paid and what have you. But I just wanted to sort of keep reading this wonderful, wonderful book. So, you know, it was, it was a revelation. It really was a fantastic bit of reading. So I've just reread it for the third, or I think fourth time. And while Never Let Me Go focuses on the relationship of three clones in an alternate England, where medical science means that people can be duplicated and then the duplicates are raised like orphans in institutions for later use as organ donors, it does look at the wider social implications as well, but in a very subtle way, in a way which I really enjoyed and I think needs to be highlighted in any discussion of this book. So Never Let Me Go is very English in its tone and setting. And, you know, you immediately think of John Wyndham, a very English SF writer who influenced, you know, every SF writer in England after him. Clark and Wyndham. Clark influenced the sort of Baxters, Reynolds, what have you. And Wyndham influenced the Ballards, the Priests, the Roberts, those people. So it's a real sort of two sort of strand thing in modern British SF. And really there is a similarity to midwich because of course there's children in midwich they are aliens of course they are implanted into their host mother's wombs they are a gestalt entity they're genetically identical they have a kind of telepathic communication thing going on and that raises questions of twins and you think about twins monozygotic twins identical twins and that's quite interesting because of course we know from studies that even when they're separated at birth monozygotic twins which of course are always the same sex um, will often marry people with the same name they'll wear the same colors and their lives will be intertwined it's almost like spooky action at a distance in quantum physics so that suggests that you know nature genetics heredity is possibly more powerful than nurture so it's interesting stuff of course people don't like to think there's any kind of determinism in that at all and they think it's all about culture but obviously there's more to it than that there obviously is nature and biology dictating a lot of what we do so yes yeah, so you think of Wyndham because of course there's lots of sort of very English stuff the children grow up at an institution called Hailsham which appears to be like a public school and it also has the quietly carefully repressed emotions that you get in classic English prose and the novel uses something which many many novelists have used classic dramatic thing the Love Triangle by Bob Shaw did it in The Two Timers. That's a good one, worth comparing this to as well. And he looks at three young people growing up in this institution called Hailsham, Kathy, Tommy and Ruth. And Kathy, who's the main protagonist, sometimes reminded me of the narrator of The Remains of the Day, because she's it's first person narrative and it's from her point of view. And Kathy is somebody who sort of holds it back a bit she sort of holds things back she holds her feelings inside herself and they sometimes come out and she's quite clipped sometimes and rueful about tommy who she clearly has a thing for and tommy is a strange boy he's kind of the butt of the jokes and when the story starts the kids are probably about seven or eight maybe a little bit older there's all sorts of incidents where he's depicted as being a bit of a fool but he eventually starts a relationship with Ruth, who's better looking and she's a little bit of a gossip. So you get this classic love triangle and, and rivalry and friendship throughout and their feelings move back and forth for each other's and there's a closeness and they move towards their destiny as they grow up as carers 
for other donors, for other clones who are by that point donating organs. And this happens between their 20s and, and their sort of early 30s at the latest. And the completists, the people who, the clones who, once they have donated two, three or four organs, simply die. And there are hints that something happens to them beyond completion, that maybe completion isn't death, but there's a kind of living death. But we'll say no more about that. The children are very engaged in certain rituals, and one of them is about being creative, doing art, writing poetry, drawing pictures. And Tommy is no good at art, and he doesn't really put anything into it. He's not really part of that thing, and he is a bit of a square peg in a round hole. So there's a very big thing made about the children want to draw pictures and write poetry and create things, which will go into something called the gallery. And there's a woman called Madame who visits the school now and again and who looks at their art. And if it goes into the gallery, that's deemed to be something special. And it's very, very mysterious. Also in the novel, as the children grow up, there remains something childlike and childish about them. And there's a subtle implication in the prose that this is a kind of side effect of them being clones, that they never really grow up. And they know that their destiny means that none of them will ever fulfill their dreams. None of them will be going to late adulthood. So it's almost like a Logan's Run thing there, because in Logan's Run, the novel, everybody lives till 21. It's 30 in the TV series and film, I seem to recall. So there is this sort of dreaminess where they're hoping and trying to push the reality aside. They wonder where their originals are, the people they're modelled on, and they have all these theories about them being social misfits, or maybe they're ordinary people working in offices and what have you. And as the trio grow and they go apart and then together, it's like waves going in and out. And you know what your real relationship are like with people? They blow hot and cold. And the ravishing lambency of a sugarous prose, which is so consummate at delineating the small but significant things of human existence. And one example is a cassette tape owned by Kathy that plays a torch song called Never Let Me Go. And it's never mawkish or overly sentimental. That's the beauty of Ish's writing. He does focus on feelings and people's emotions, but at the same time, he does have a sort of hard heart under that, where he is using these things, exploiting them and revealing them to make a bigger picture for us to see later on. These small things in human existence tend to dominate Ish's narratives. There's, I call him Ish because Christopher Priest calls him Ish because he knows him. So, and occasionally we've talked about him. And fundamentally, it's the small things. I mean, in Ishiguru's book, um, Artist the Floating World, there's a wonderful sequence where the narrator, who is an old man, um, is talking to his grandson, who's a little boy, about the Godzilla films that the little boy's just been to see. And the word Godzilla's never used, but you know that they're Keiju films from what the little boy is saying. And it's just wonderful, touching stuff. You know, it really is fantastic. So there is that image of the giant destroying monster as being the sense of wonder in the child, the sense of wonder that we seek in SF. So, you know, that's the Inishiguro as well. And he has this wonderful facility with character, with interaction of interpersonal relationships and dialogue, which is wonderfully realistic and well observed. You know, he knows how people talk or what they don't say. And sometimes it's what Kathy doesn't say, the what counts and what she says in her internal monologue to us. The book has got a kind of harshness as well as the sensitivity, and that comes up more as the narrative goes on. And in its depiction of the sometimes Spartan world in which the children live and grow, the book builds to a climax. And this is where its real SF meat comes out. So if you're reading it, you're not used to this sort of narrative. If you don't normally read these very detailed character interactions, you know, stick with it because it becomes something else. At the climax, the real nature of the society which surrounds the clones is revealed and its moral criminality shocks and tears at us. As readers, we realise the fully dystopian status of this alternate world and it's revealed by Shiguru and its craven hideousness. And that's the genius of Never Let Me Go. Ishiguru uses our identification with the tears, triumphs and unique, alive in our hearts personalities of Kathy, Ruth and Tommy. And they're not always sympathetic, they can be unsympathetic. We can find Tommy irritating, we can find Ruth callous, we can find Kathy 
sometimes too harsh herself and we rail at her failure to say what she really feels and means sometimes but we've all known people like them but at the same time they remain individual characters despite being clones what Ishiguro does is he indicates clearly the nature of the society that they're being raised in while leaving it outside the frame of the book he depicts the characters but cuts off most of the picture outside they are milieu directly by framing them along the real meat is outside that picture frame and revealed near to the denouement and it's what's outside the frame in never let me go the sony hinted at that you build up like a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces which really makes it devastating and you ask yourself what sort of society would clone people use them as organ backs and how bad does that treatment get and you see this picture building up and it does remind me in lots of ways of this book, um, Norman Spinrad's Bug Jack Baron, which has a similar theme, very different in tone, written in the 1960s, but it's a similar theme. And there's a kind of quiet anger in Ishiguro, whereas, of course, in Spinrad, it sort of pours out like molten lava. And we love him for that reason, in the same way that we love Ishiguro for what he holds back. This is a nails scraped down a blackboard condemnation of the use of science without moral authority and the people who question that usage, but who don't go far enough. They fail. In this novel, maybe even the apparently good people might not be as noble as they seem. Or are they? You decide when you read the book. While I was less enamoured of Never Let Me Go on my latest reading, um, I do think it's a masterwork and one of the very few SF novels by a non-genre writer which has achieved the status of something superb as SF because he hints and underplays what is outside that frame in a wonderfully judged way until he slots those bits into place and they're just handfuls of lines whereas in a genre SF novel it would probably be overstated in this everything's understated but the impact is still there when those moments come and those jigsaw puzzles clack into place because in the game of clones in Never Let Me Go you don't win you just die. There's a great film version which was written for the screen by Alex Garland, the author of The Beach. He wrote two other novels. He then abandoned prose fiction for writing screenplays and for directing. And of course, he directed and screen wrote the film of Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. He did a wonderful TV series called Devs, which has been on the BBC, best SF series I've seen for years. And a recent film called men which is really good a very very strange weird fiction film very good stuff indeed and the only kind of sf detail that garland added to the film is a little detail of when the children go out of whatever domain they're living in whether it's hailsham the large institution or later on they live like communally in a small cottage they have a little wristband which they touch on a box by the door to sort of sign in and out as if they're clocking on and off in a factory and that's the only thing which isn't in the novel which is added by Garland and it's a master touch and Carey Mulligan is entirely convincing and toothsome in her hard sweetness and a nuanced portrayal of Kathy who is sometimes unsympathetic and raw but ultimately makes us ache for her in her suppressed agony. It's a wonderful piece of work and it's a great film as well. It really, really is one of the best SF films of recent years. So that's my thinking on Never Let Me Go about how the genius is, is what's left outside the frame and Ishiguro gradually zooms out and those little facts and implications come into place and we get the fuller picture of the horror of Never Let Me Go. I want to talk now about another great cloning novel, probably the best one from genre SF, and that's Kate Wilhelm's Where Late the Sweet Bird Sang. And Kate Wilhelm is sort of recognised really for confident crime novels, which were bestsellers in the US. She wrote mainstream novels as well. And, you know, she has been one of the sort of best known female SF writers. And really, Where Late the Sweet Bird Sang probably is regarded by the critics as the finest example of 
colonial literature to date until Ishiguri come along. And it's got a sort of becalmed and lambent three act structure, which provides an unhistorical reminder that to be human is to be unique and that to be different is to be sublime. Where Lake the Sweet Bird Sang was published in 1976 and is set in a remote rural area of upstate Washington and there's a farming clan called the Summers and they're sort of comfortable and they're engaged in some research. They've got this research hospital they founded and the government are backing them and as the world slips into economic collapse and that's worsened by widespread pollution and escalating military action, David Summer, one of the main characters in the book, completes his studies in genetics at Harvard University and then he returns home to work in the hospital on his parents estate. Then a lethal epidemic spreads across the USA and leaves all the survivors sterile. So then David gets to work against time to perfect the ultimate survival strategy for this increasingly barren and gradually declining human race. And that of course is cloning. Then a limited nuclear war begins and the isolated community sees its numbers dwindle. But David's research begins to bear fruit grown in tanks and a computer control, the cloned embryos reach post-uterine age. The immediate survival of the colony is therefore guaranteed, but experiments with mice show that the fourth generation of the clones will not be viable and contact with the outside world ceases as civilization gradually falls silent. Then the clones mature, gradually taking over the settlement and David and his contemporaries realize that these inheritors of the earth are different. Like identical twins, and like the gestalt entity aliens in John Wyndham's Midwich Cuckoos, they share more than just the same genes. With each new generation, the clones become more like facets of a single organism than individuals, sharing emotions and attitudes. Shade you again, obviously, of more than human by Sturgeon. But then a child is born into the community who will either be the salvation of the clones by helping them raid the dead cities for scientific materials, or he will prove their undoing because he is a singular, unique being whose individuality is as perilous to himself as it is to his hosts. The book has also a kind of gentle pastoral feel, which is very, how could I put it, it's quite deceptive and it gets under your skin and it's quite quiet. So you do wonder if Ish ever read it. He probably didn't, but if you've read Never Let Me Go, you really should read Where Late the Sweet Birds Sang. And thinking about it again now, a lot of the quiet rural power of it, the sort of agrarian setting, it does make me want to go back to it again and it also makes me think of the tone of Earth Abides by George R. Stewart. If you're wondering what the other book on the stand there was, this is Cloning by David Sear, published by Robert Hale. And this dates back to, I think, let's see, this is a 70s book. Let's have a look at it. Um, 1972, very obscure book. I've not read it, I've had it for a few years. I bought it on a whim and it's from Merthyr Public Library. Um, and this used to be a horrific place, so there is like now, just up the valley from me. And it's just called Cloning. And I'll be interested to see what this is like. So at some point, maybe we'll have Game of Clones Part 2. And let me know what cloning novels you've read. And if there's anything I should check out that I can't think of now. Anyway, bye for now. Oh, and of course, you remember how it is. Like, subscribe, super thanks. Like, subscribe, super thanks. You get the idea. Everything happens at least twice. Bye for now. Bye for now.